Testing, testing. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to CS uh, 4510. Uh, this is lecture 01A. Um, this is just the introduction. So today we're just going to do a very gentle uh, introduction to the material. The, this class, I think, is conceptually challenging, so we need to do, we need to ramp up a little slower. Um, so the format of the class, I guess before we get in too deep into what's the point of the class, the format of the class is basically summer has a lot longer lecture time than fall and spring. There's two 130-minute classes a week. And so what I'm going to do is two 60-minute lectures a day with a 10-minute break in between. So right now we'll do 10 minutes of lecture. I'll record it, and I'm uploading this to YouTube, and then we'll do 10-minute break, and then we'll do another 60 minutes of lecture, something like this, right? I've up, you may have noticed already, but I've uploaded last semester's summer lectures, which uh, I thought were really great. I was really happy with that. That's sort of my magnum opus. And I didn't really know if I could uh, outdo them, but I'm going to try this, uh, this summer. I think there was only three typos in the last lectures, so I was, I was pretty happy about that. Uh, grading, it's not too hard. There's like, uh, you can take this course remotely if you want, two-thirds of this class. Is, is already graduated and is currently in San Francisco Bay at an internship. So I allow them to take this class remotely. Um, there's seven-ish homeworks, eight-ish homeworks, and three exams. The exams are all take home and open note. The homeworks are all, uh, of course, take home as well. So this class can be done remotely. As a trade-off, it's a little harder. I do put more challenging problems in there. No simple, easy. Uh, two plus two kind of questions. Um, let's see. So CS4510, the title of the class is officially uh, Automaton Complexity. Um, but it covers you know, quite a bit. There's quite a other things tangential to that. Um, this is like simultaneously, I think, the most important and least important class that you'll take in your CS degree. Uh, it can be both of those things at once. It's simultaneously the least important because you're not going to, like you take a compiler's class, you go and then you like write a compiler. You take a database class, then you go and you like know how to use a database. Things like this. You're not going to take an automata and complexity class and know how to like go build an automata. That doesn't really matter. But the automata is simply a tool, a conceptual tool that we use to understand much deeper, uh, hard to formalize, but intricate philosophical problems. It's simply a tool. It has, it's, in some sense, has nothing to do with the automata. It's the least important class because it won't actually make you a better software engineer, if that's what your goal is. Um, it's the most important class, though, because it actually teaches, I think, what computer science is. Computer science is very different than programming. Programming, you know, you push the buttons on the keyboard, and then the, le the lights light up on the screen, and then things somehow, uh, you know, that's how a computer works. This is a course about like science itself, like uh, why is computer science called a science? Why are we not like a discipline of engineering? You know, something like this. We, how we apply the scientific method, how we think about things. It, it's, a, it, it's an incredible course. Um, many of you will come in with a disease I will call a CS brain syndrome, which is that every tool you've ever learned, everything you've ever done is in some sense advancing the goal to, you know, make you build a missile guidance system or increase a clicks per ad metric or something so you may become one of those jobs that doesn't do anything but you get paid a lot of money to sit at a computer and then you can afford groceries, right? One of these kinds of jobs. And it's not wrong to come into a computer science degree with this attitude. Actually, it's incredible. It's what maybe what you should do. But it's not helpful, I think, in this class because many people will ask questions about this kind of view, you know, can I do this in a better way? Can I do this in a more optimal way? But most of the questions we'll ask, especially in the first two-thirds of the course, first 70% of the course, have nothing to do what's the most efficient or best or optimal way to do something. It's whether or not something is possible at all. So it's not about optimality in some sense, but about possibility. What is even possible at all? Um, that takes, I think, a little bit of training for people to get used to. And, but once you do, it, it, I think it, it, it evolves quite easily. There's two 
things that we do in this course. First is on computability theory. Computability theory is uh, like what does computation mean? What is a computer? Now, a computer is not the thing that you hold in your lap and then you push buttons on and the lights flash up in a certain pattern. You know, what really is a computer fundamentally? Um, not only that, but what are the limits of the computer? Like, what kind of things can you even do with a computer? As someone, as people who have used a computer a lot, you've probably ask yourself, wow, the computer can do all these things. But have you ever asked yourself, is there anything a computer can't do? This is sort of the extremal kind of thinking that we'll have to apply in the first two-thirds of the course. Uh, this, the last third is on, actually, complexity theory. Complexity theory is sort of a resource-bounded version, basically, of computability theory. And if computability theory asks what's possible at all, complexity theory is like what's possible within a certain set of resources. You know, what makes some problems easy and others hard. These are the two uh, questions that we'll ask in the class, and it's going to take us the whole semester to answer those two questions. Um, I think this is a very intricate and beautiful uh, class. It's my favorite. It's my pet. Uh, computability theory, in some sense, uh, all of these have you know, a, a, a sort of story to them. Computability theory, if you were to compare it to a movie genre, would probably be a drama. There's lots of uh, twists and turns. But in some sense, every question that we could ask in computability theory has been solved. It has been solved, perhaps, in a dramatic way. But we know the answers to all these questions. We know how to answer the questions. Uh, complexity theory, in contrast, I would describe as a horror film. Um, because while we don't maybe like the answers that we have in computability theory, we at least know what the answers are. In complexity theory, we don't know how to answer anything, essentially. Um, one of these questions, p is equal to np. Uh, but p does not equal np. p equals np is like one question, but it's really a thousand related qu questions, perhaps by conditionally, perhaps only conditionally, such as uh, p, p space, and other questions. We'll talk about this ex extensively. But, uh, the reason it's a horror, uh, I would call this a horror genre, is that not only do we know, we know what the questions are, we don't know how to answer them, but we know how not to answer them. We have results, theorems, that say, actually, this is a hard question to answer. That doesn't, we know how not to prove the question, but that doesn't bring us anywhere closer to proving the question. But we know that certain proofs won't prove it. We're essentially much farther from the question than we were when we began. That, I think, is uh, part of the beauty of that part. Now, there has been, like, this problem is only like 50 years old, right? I think 53 years old. Cook uh, defined the problem in 1971. Um, and, you know, a generation of scientists have uh, gone into the mines, so to speak, developed a theory of attack of, of problems trying to solve this. And dramatically, someone else comes around five years later and says, not only did that not prove P does not equal NP, but provably it could not ever prove P does not equal NP. So generations and generations of scientists have been metaphorically slaughtered by this problem. They become experts in a certain technique. They define the technique. They express how to do this. And then, oh, actually, it, the, the golden goose, the problem you wanted to solve, it doesn't work. It provably won't work. So there are eras and generations in this, and it'll take us again the second half of the course to, to talk about these. But we know, really, this is a really hard problem. I can't express the thousand problems that are related to this problem that are all as hard of it. You may have some understanding of p not equal np from algorithms, right? All of you took 3510 to get in here. All of you remember vaguely what an np-complete problem is, right? Um, you'll have to refresh yourself, but that's much later. That's like, like July. So... Um, that's really not just 1,000, but maybe 1,000 problems, right? Um, right? 
Any questions so far on computability theory and complexity theory on what, what expectations are the course? Anything syllabus related? Uh, what's the grade distribution of like exams and assignments? Ah, thirty percent is going to be th three exams and a final with lowest ones dropped. The other homeworks, seven of them, eight of them are going to be ten percent, uh, seventy percent. So there's eight, nine, ten homeworks. There'll be one lowest homework will be dropped as well. They'll, but they'll account for the total of seventy percent. There should be one homework a week. It should be about six problems. More logistics questions, more material questions, right? Uh, how many of you are computer science majors? Actually, let me change that. How many of you are not computer science majors? OK, it was easier. You're not a computer science major. Like I, have, I am CS, but I'm also something else. I don't know if What is it, something else? Math. OK, well, this is a math class, so I was a math major. Um, uh, right. Any more questions, material-wise, syllabus-wise? Yes. So we're writing math, not code. I don't know how to program. Cool. I'm tired of writing code. I, 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 the cool part about this class, so actually, what is an automata? Like, let me answer your question in a roundabout way to segment back into ranting. An automata is, well, uh, let me even go backwards. What do you think an automata is? What, is, what comes to your precognition when I use the word automata? Conway's Game of Life or something. Conway's Game of Life, that's a good one. There's another pop science thing that people may think of when they think of automata. What does the word automata mean? In any context? Like a, something automatic? Something automatic, automata, that sounds right. Mr. understands Latin. <laughs> uh, what else? Is there any other pop science thing you may have heard of the word automata in? I'm always curious, there's a movie called Hugo. Have you guys heard of the movie Hugo? It was like the invention of Hugo Cabret. It, they, they got this story about this like British peasant, and he's eating peas or something in a train station, and he's, his dad died. And then he lives in the train station because he's homeless. But his dad built, his dad was like a watchmaker or something, and built this really complicated mechanical person. And he's like trying to find parts to restore and build this person. And when he finally turns the person on, it like has a billion gears in it, and it draws a picture of a moon with the eye in it, which is a reference to the first early French... Uh, fictional films. But an automata, in that sense, is this complicated mechanical device that's like moving and clicking and doing things, you know? Uh, and this is really what like computation is about, right? So like many people have tried and failed to define what computation is. And we'll talk about extensively the history of this. The first successful person to do this was Alan Turing. And he was the first to realize that computation is doing things, right? It's doing things. Everyone write that down. It's, in some sense, action. It, it's perhaps mechanical, but it is in motion. It's physical. It's a process. And a function, unfortunately, is not that, necessarily. A function could be that, but a function is simply a definition between an input and an output, and doesn't serve as the best definition of what a computation is. The formal definition of automata is a theoretical model of a computer. It's a simple definition of something. And this can be used to simulate either like in reference to a kind of programming language, maybe a kind of computer architecture, maybe a specific physical process or something like this. The, the automata is a pure abstraction, an, ex, an extraction of an abstraction. And uh, when you get an automata, you study what the automata can and can't do. And then maybe you can make some analogy, if, if at all, to what it's supposed to be uh, a model of. You know, Let's say you have an auto some sort of theoretical representation of a programming language, then you say, well, this programming language can't do this thing. Then you know that the real programming language can do something like this, right? Most programming languages can do all, everything, though, so that doesn't really, maybe not the clearest example. Um, right, so that's, the automata does, really tells us, like, uh, we, we're, we're not studying the programs. The automata, writing an automata is basically writing a kind of program, a kind of code, but we're concerned with the kind of problems that can be solved by the automata, rather than the automata themselves. The framework of the class is set on inspection of the problems. And we'll define that later today, how to study a problem. Uh, any more questions on just basic stuff? Introductory, anything so far? Today's just the, this first half of today is sort of a slow ramp up. All right, let's introduce the TAs. Let's say hi, TAs. So I'm Sean. Nice to meet you all. I'm your GTA. Um, 
Um, okay. Um, it's really important for this class that you attend office hours and that you stick you stick in there. A lot of problems need to be solved collaboratively, and it will take some discussion to get them. So it's important that you stick around in office hours, and they'll choose their office hours times. It'll be in person, maybe, and remote on Zoom, maybe. I don't, I'll let them decide. You know, I also have office hours uh, occasionally. Um, whenever my door is open, you can come ask me questions. Piazza as well is really important. It's really important that you uh, have a Piazza tab open at all times. Even if you have simple questions, don't be afraid to ask. You can post anonymously. Everyone always asks the first question of every semester, is zero even? The answer is yes, but it, is, it takes a second. So if you even have such simple questions, don't worry about it. Just it's, You'll learn by, by asking, right? Um, right. So maybe we should just get into the material. Any more questions on, on what, why we're in this class, why you need to take this class? Every year people leave the class and they're like, well, I don't know why I took the class. So I need to make sure that you understand the point of it, you know. Okay, good. Um, right, so first we need to define like how, what, what a problem is. How do problems work? What does that mean? So we need some sort of syntax to engage with problems. Um, so we need a way to represent ideas, right? So you have ideas, they're in your head somehow. How do you get the ideas out? You have to represent them using language. The, the way we'll do that is with sequences of symbols, strings. So first we need to define what a string is made of atomically. What goes into a string? Characters. Characters, symbols, letters, glyphs, whatever those are called. So we'll define sigma to be uh, a finite set of symbols. So for example, it could be like a b, it could be like 0, 1, it could be like a z, a z, could be like, I don't know, ASCII. How many symbols are in ASCII? I don't remember. But ASCII, certainly I think there's finitely many symbols defined in ASCII. Um, what else could it be? It could be like a, b, c. It could even just be a. But it couldn't be empty set. Let's just suppose there exist symbols. If nothing, if there are no symbols, then everything kind of trivially doesn't exist. Um, so two questions you may have. Immediately, everyone tries to generalize and specialize. Uh, why is the set of symbols finite? Like, why not just consider a theory that develops everything on an infinite set of symbols? Uh, there are two answers for this question. One, uh, it doesn't really matter like what the alphabet is. The problems that we want to study will be independent of the way we write them down, it turns out. And so what the choice of alphabet is matters not that much, it turns out. Um, uh, the second thing is that you could reprove every theorem in this class using an infinite alphabet, but then every theorem would be different, and you would get a totally different result. That would then be mathematics and not computer science. The reason we use a finite set of symbols is simply because as humans, when we do computation, we use a finite set of symbols, right? Think about the way you write things down. What would it mean, what would it even mean in terms of a computer having access to write down infinitely many symbols? Or you with pen and paper knowing infinitely many symbols? Now, this doesn't mean there's not infinitely many words, because a word is a combination of symbols. But the basic atomic, the, uh, the, the symbol, the glyph, the character, whatever you call it, is finite. Right? We agree. Um, questions on the alphabet. Okay. What about uh, what if I, what is sigma squared? Set of all things that are made up of two symbols put together, probably. In what order? How? Uh, rigorous, yeah. semantic. You need uh, a rigorous definition. Combination, permutation. Those words can be ambiguous. What is it? Sigma squared. There's a word for it. Cartesian product. Cartesian product. I will remind you that the Cartesian products of sets A times B is equal to the set of pairs a comma b, such that a is an a, and a b is an b, right? So sigma squared is simply uh, all combinations of sigma and sigma. Now, we're going to drop the parentheses and the comma and just write it. Right? What is that? Set. 
got four elements in it. What is, what's another name for that set? Two character words. Words. Yeah, words of length two. OK, those are all possible words of length two, right? Wow. Symbols, words. First jump. Questions? How do you get from like sigma, sigma squared, which sounds like two of the same set, to a times a cross b? Well, if sigma squared is actually just shorthand for sigma times sigma. So then, so then it isn't. Then a equals b. Not necessarily. OK. A, b, such that a is an a, and b is an You could replace sigma here and sigma here. Yeah, that's what I meant. OK, cool. So it's all pairs. Yeah, it's not necessarily a, a, b, b. Right. Um, pop quiz, what is sigma to the n? Words of length n. Words of length n. Pop quiz, what is the cardinality of sigma to the n? The size of the elements, a finite set. What is, what is the number of elements in sigma to the n? The cardinality of sigma to the power n. Yeah. All right, what is a sigma to the 0? The empty set. No. We'll explain why, though. I knew someone would say that. All words of length zero. How That's many one. elements are in sigma zero? One. It's not empty. It contains a single element we call epsilon. And this is different than the epsilon. Epsilon is the single string of length zero, where epsilon is equal to that. Epsilon is a special symbol we use to denote the empty string, right? Because we don't want to do the quote thing every time. But notice that this is a set of one element which contains the empty string. There's only one string of length zero. By the way, why, when are two strings equal? If they have each symbol is identical, right? That's when two strings are equal. So the number of strings of length zero, they're all is, is just one string. They're all the same, right? Uh, there's a slight difference between the empty string and the empty set. The empty set is a set containing no objects. But the empty string is a string of length 0 with no symbols in it. And the difference between these two, maybe to a mathematician, is less useful than one to a computer scientist. If you think of in programming language terms, there's a type error between these two. This is like an array of no elements. This is like a string that has nothing in it. right? Now, I think certain languages like C don't have every C string is an array, right? something like this. So it, it depends on how you interpret that. But this has no, no elements in it. This is a set, and this is a string. They're fundamentally different. right? And the interplay between them will come in later. Right? Question on empty string, sigma 0. OK. What about, uh, the union of i is equal to 0 uh, to infinity of sigma i. This is going to be sigma 0, union sigma 1, union. All words. All words. Why? Because you're taking the going from epsilon all the way up to every word with n characters going to infinity. Here's a, maybe another way I would word that. Every string has a length and then is therefore in it. So the set of all strings would, must be a subset of it, but certainly it's a subset of that. So double second containment, quick. Right. We define this actually to be uh, something called sigma star. Sigma star is a notation we mean for all strings, every and all strings. Right? Is the empty string in sigma star? Yeah. So. Uh, I have to mention this every class, but there is no string of infinite length, right? People automatically generalize because they say, well, you know, certain times a decimal expansion is infinite. Well, isn't that not a string? The answer is no. Computer, we're computer people here. Every string is finite length. Um, and don't get this infinite union confused with that, right? Uh, 
J this only, again, can st still contains finite length strings, right? Questions so far? All right, we do a little mathematical shorthand, like uh, uh, a to the 5. We use kind of a multiplica multiplicative notation. This means a, 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 a. So a to the 5 basically means the symbol a five times. It's as if you're doing multiplication, but a is not like a number or an element of some algebraic structure or whatever. It's our matrix or whatever. It's like just a symbol. So it's just a way to expand that. Um, we also could do like a, b, 3, d, c, something like this. If you see notation like this, what this means is like d, a, b, a, b, a, b, c, right? And then that is different than like d, a cubed, b cubed, c, which is d, a, 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 b, 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 c, right? Not notation you've ever seen before because nobody has ever defined a string like this. But in this class, maybe we want to, so we will. Questions on this part? We understand the notation. There's no analogous addition operator. It's just an exponentiation, right? So a language, what do you think a language is? Intuitively, if we gave a definition of alphabet, what do we think a language is? All, like all the words using the alphabet. All the words? Is every sentence in the language? Is every sequence of symbols in the, in the language? Is every se sequence of symbols part of, the alpha part of the language we speak? I guess there's a, a certain amount of words that we say we understand. Sure. So just to be specific, we'll say a subset of strings. It's a selection of the strings. So it's not necessarily every string, but it is some of the strings. Right? That's what a language is, the collection of strings. Now, this is basically how we formalize uh, what a problem is. We formalize it as using set theory. We formalize a, a language. Then every problem, every computational problem can be deduced to one of set membership. Right? So consider the following languages. L is like a finite set. Let's say A, A. Let's say B, B. A, A, B, B. All right, that's a finite set. That is a language, certainly. Right? What about like... Uh, you can use set builder notation. W is in sigma star. Uh, w begins with an A. Where sigma is equal to AB. What is the size of L1 here? How many strings are in L1? more than two. How many strings begin with an A? Half? Half, Half of what? If you're doing sigma star, where your original sigma is A and B. How many strings are in sigma star? All if not, or something like that. There are infinitely many strings, and there are also infinitely many strings that begin with an A. So this is an infinite subset of an infinite set. Um, similarly, L2. The number of A's in W is even. And this means the number of A's in W. That's what that's shorthand for, right? The number of A's in W is even. This is also an infinite language, correct? Yes. So we are allowed to have languages of infinite size. Not only are we allowed to have languages of infinite size, your first homework problem will be to prove that we actually don't care about finite languages. Anything useful is an infinite language, it turns out. What about um, L3? Uh, A to the n, n is even. What are some strings in this language? First off, this language is infinite again, right? What are some strings in this language? Is the infinite, is uh, the empty set in this language, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Why? In the beginning, you said zero is an even number. Zero is not only an even number, zero is a natural number as well. So in this class, zero is a natural number. 
Not only is it a natural number, it's the most natural number. It's the only natural number. Every number is derived in some sense from the fact that zero is a natural number. When we speak of the natural numbers, we, inc we are including zero. Uh, so zero is a natural. So a to the zero is what? We didn't uh, formally define what it means to exponentiate a symbol in a string. But what if you had to guess, what is a to the zero? Epsilon. Epsilon. A to the zero, a to the n is n copies of a. So a to the zero is zero copies of a. What is zero copies of a? Empty string, right? Um, what about um, this? What other strings are in here? A a a a a a, and so on, right? It does not contain a, any strings that have a b in them. If a string has a b, it's not in the language. Agree? Right. What about? Um, uh, w is in sigma star. The number of a's in w is congruent to 3 or 4 mod 7. Also, following the previous pattern, it's, just an, it's also an infinite language. Uh, let's do one more. Everyone knows how to py use Python, the casting function, int of w, comma, 2 is prime. What this basically does is it talks, it takes in a, 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 a string of zeros and ones, and it returns a type of number. So we can't say a string is prime or not, but we can say this string is an encoding of a number, which is prime or not. Right? Is the empty set in this language? It's a trick question. Um, the reason it's a trick question is because Python actually returns an error if you, try to, to if you try to cast the empty string. If you cast zero, it will return. It's an, it, if you cast zero, it'll, it'll work, right? Um, two quick comments we can make about this. First off, the point of the languages that we define this way is like, given a specific kind of computer, what we're going to do is give the automata a way to read input. We're going to give it a string. And then we're going to attach to it two bells or two lights or two something. It's going to be able to raise a card and say yes. It's going to raise or raise a card and say no. And it's going to have the ability to distinguish good strings from bad strings. And it's going to then decide some language. The language it decides are the strings that it accepts, we say. So it's going to be able to distinguish the good from the bad. And if a certain kind of automata can, defi can compute or decide, we'll define what that means later, decide a certain language, then obviously it has that kind of computational power, right? Notice that some of these languages are harder or easier than others. Um, you could make a computer to do L1 kind of easily, right? What you do is you read the string, and then you check if the first symbol is an A or not an A. And then that's basically it. You can kind of ignore the rest of the input. The second thing is some of these languages seem harder than other. Any kind of computational model which could do L4 here probably could do modular arithmetic. Maybe constant modular arithmetic, like k. It's not a parameter here. It's just 7. Um, any computer that can do L5, you could probably assert has the power of primality. It can distinguish between prime numbers and not prime numbers. And if it can do other things, it can do all the cool things that prime numbers allow you to do. You know, uh, factorization, GCD, maybe these kinds of things. So um, we will formalize a computer's ability to solve a problem or not by the language it's able to decide, right? But we're going to, we're not going to, rarely will we look at the computer and ask what, dis, what language it decides. Rather, we'll look at the language and ask what, what kind of computers, what kind of automata can decide it, right? So this is how we formulate a problem as a decision problem, as a set membership problem. Let's, we'll formalize that in, in a second, but any questions on this part so far?
and automata, or a computational model, or decision procedure, or process, uh, we'll call it M, uh, takes as input uh, W. Uh, then we, it computes on W and returns some Boolean. It accepts or rejects w, right? And when we run m on w, the way we say this is we say m of w, kind of functionally, right? w is given as the input machine m. Now, m here vaguely defined because it'll be true for any kind of, uh, we'll, we'll have many different kinds of uh, models of automata, and they'll have different ways of computing and different ways of accepting. Um, we say uh, M decides language L if uh, W is an L, if and only if uh, M on W accepts. And we say W is not an L if and only if M on W rejects. This is probably the most important definition of the course because it's how we interpret the machine language correspondence. It's chapter zero. So um, the machine has two lights or two bells or two signals, two wires, whatever. It has a good and a bad. And it performs its computation. It does whatever it's going to do. And then it says ding, ding, or the buzzer, ah, and it says, you know, I'm accepting that or I'm not accepting that, right? Now, every machine vaguely, whatever the machine is, we haven't defined it, has to accept some language, right? So we say L of M is the, is the set of strings M accepts. So every machine accepts some language, right? Um, barring certain assumptions on what that machine is for now. But we're not really concerned, given a specific machine, what, what is its behavior. That's called programming. We're concerned with the reverse problem. Uh, given L, what kinds of machines decide it? Right? So given a fixed language, there can be multiple kinds of machines to do it. Yes? So why can't L of M be empty, or is that just definition? Oh, it could be empty. Consider a machine that is wired in such a way to always reject. Perhaps you could write code to do something like this. We haven't explained too detail. Again, we haven't explained what an automata is or an example of one. But suppose we were doing programming languages. You made a, you made a program to always return zero. Excuse me, always return false. The language that that machine, that program would accept would be the empty set. Okay. Yeah. So W is not an L if and only if M rejects. And if that specific M rejects all strings, then there you go. Um, Similarly, there, there's a machine that always returns true. Just say return true, and that accepts what language? All of them. What's the name of that? Star, sigma, star. Yeah, so that would be sigma star. By the way, those two machines are complements of each other because the complement of sigma star is the empty set. The complement of all strings is no strings, the empty set. Okay. Right. Um, so given a, given a fixed language, we're concerned with... There are, infinitely pos there are infinitely many possible kinds of machines to do it. So we're fixing the problem and considering the kinds of automata that are possible. We're not doing the other problem, which is given the, given the algorithm, what does it do? What is its one behavior? We're concerned with the language, in some sense, is the behavior of the program, the intended behavior. We're concerned with what kinds of possible programs simulate that behavior. You know? Think about sorting. Sorting is one defined problem. Input, an array. Output a sorted array. But there's multiple algorithms that can do this. And then we compare and contrast them. Oh, this one's faster. This one does this one thing. Whatever, right? So given the problem being fixed, we concern ourselves with the possible solutions it has. That's the way we will study the class. Given a language, what are, its, what are, what are the algorithms to solve it? Not given an algorithm, what does it do? You know. Questions so far? All right. <clears throat> 